welcome to worship. Uh, traditionally, on that first Sunday after Pentecost, we celebrate Holy Trinity Sunday. And it's on, on this day that, that we focus on the revelation that God gives us in his word, that he is triune. It means he is three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and yet he is just one God. Now, obviously, that's not something that, that we can, can rationally comprehend. But it, it is a truth that must be apprehended by faith. And our triune God is our creator, our redeemer, and our sanctifier. And we'll begin our worship on the top of, of your worship folder. And if you're watching online, you can uh, download one of those worship folders by following the link below this video. But we begin at the top of your worship folder. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll continue with our scripture lessons. There is sometimes the false impression that, that the doctrine of the Trinity is just a New Testament doctrine. While it's certainly made more clear, I think, in the, in the New Testament, we see our triune God in, in the Old Testament as well. In our Old Testament lesson, taken from the very first chapter of the Bible, we see evidence of our triune God. Uh, we read portions of the creation account from Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. And by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all his work of creating that he had done. This is the word of our Lord. In our gospel lesson, we hear Jesus' great commission. And we hear him give the command to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in the name of our triune God. We read from Matthew chapter 28, read verses 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. 
And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the gospel of our Lord. Our epistle lesson will serve as the basis for the sermon message. Uh, And the epistle lesson is the conclusion of the Apostle Paul's uh, second letter to the Corinthians. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people here send their greetings. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This is the word of our Lord. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, it used to be a song that was reserved for special occasions, namely birthdays. But then the CDC released some guidelines on hand washing. Uh, Apparently, the the tried and proven method of just rinsing your hands off and drying them on your jeans, that wasn't cutting it. And so the CDC released some some guidelines on hand washing, and one of those guidelines said that you should be scrubbing your hands with the soap suds for 20 seconds. It said a good way to, to gauge how long 20 seconds is, is to sing or hum to yourself, the tune to Happy Birthday twice. And because the CDC released those those guidelines, I now hear Allie, my two-year-old, sing Happy Birthday at least eight times in a day. I try to get her to switch it up. Of course, it's right, it's always Happy Birthday to Allie. I try to get her to switch it up, Happy Birthday to Dad every once in a while, but she has none of it, of course. But, you know, you, you take that song apart from the candles and the birthday cake, and, well, apart from a birthday... And suddenly the song has lost all significance. It it starts to become a little overused and really isn't all that special anymore. Well, in our second lesson, we have some very familiar words of blessing. These are words of blessing that have been spoken over God's people really just about ever since they have been written. In fact, we use these words of blessing very frequently in our own worship services. And we began our service this morning with with those words. And you know the words, they are, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Is it possibly the case that we hear those words so much that maybe when we hear them, we just don't give them a whole lot of thought? You know, with our minds on autopilot, we, we hear those words and then, and then, like robots, we say back to the pastor who, or who's ever officiating the service and also with you. you know, is it possible that, that we become so familiar with those words that, again, we don't give them much thought and so we divorce those words from their meaning and so they lose their personal significance to us? Well, because I think that's a real possibility, I think it's good for us today to, to look more closely at, at these words of blessing from our God. And it's a very fitting lesson for Trinity Sunday because we have just succinctly summed up with one word, the work of each person of our triune God. And so today we, we focus on, on this, this threefold blessing from our triune God. And I want to first look at these words, or, or at least first consider the context in which these words are written. This was the the conclusion of the Apostle Paul's letter to the Christians in Corinth. Now, this congregation in Corinth, they had their fair share of problems. For one thing, there was just open, gross, unrepentant sin that needed to be dealt with. And the Apostle Paul tells these Christians that that when he finally is able to come for a visit, he he intends to, to deal with that unrepentant, open sin. And then in addition there seemed to be all kinds of infighting amongst the members. I mean, apparently, there was even lawsuits being thrown back and forth among the members. And then the Apostle Paul's authority 
was being challenged. There were some from within that congregation who were challenging his authority as an apostle of the Lord. You know, this was far from a congregation that had their act together. But notice how the Apostle Paul ends this letter to them. Right before that concluding blessing, the verses leading up to it say, Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people here send their greetings. After all of his words of harsh rebuke that came previously in this letter, the Apostle Paul still calls them brothers and sisters. He tells them that, that God's people send to them their greetings. And with all that congregation was struggling with, the Apostle Paul wanted them to know that they weren't struggling alone, that, that their brothers and sisters in Christ were there with them. And why shouldn't they be? And they were all members together of the same body, of Christ's body, which is his church. And when one part of the body is struggling, well, then the rest of the body is there to support and to encourage it. And it is still that way today. You know, as members together of one body, we, we share the same goals. And those goals are to proclaim Christ, to glorify God by, by keeping his word, and by finishing the race and attaining that crown. And as we share in all those same goals, we, we encourage and we support one another in attaining those goals. You know, with a nation that is so politically and racially and ideologically divided, Christians ought to be a shining example of unity. You know, racially and politically and ideologically and economically, we might all be divided, but, but through the work of the triune God, right, we have a bond that is stronger than blood. And of course, that bond that Christians have with one another, it comes from that bond that we have with our triune three-in-one God. And so the Apostle Paul finishes up his letter with that, that threefold blessing from the triune God. And the first thing that he points to is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the basic definition of grace that we should all know is undeserved love. Is that hard for us to admit? That God's love for us is undeserved? Is that hard to admit that, that God's love for you and me, that we don't deserve it? That God really shouldn't be loving us because by ourselves we are unlovable? Is that a difficult thing to admit? I think it's certainly something that goes completely contrary to our nature. Because we're much better at recognizing our virtues than our faults, aren't we? Now, we, we can find the faults in other people just fine, right? We can find the faults in, in the police officers or the rioters or the looters. We can find the faults in the protesters. And, and maybe we can find faults in people who have different pigment in their skin than our own. But our own faults, right, are those we don't see so well, those we like to ignore. I've also noticed a little bit that it seems like as a society, we really love our villains, don't we? I guess I should rephrase that. We don't love our villains. We, we love to hate our villains, Right, we love to hate them because it's so easy to justify our hatred. And so right now it's, I actually don't know his name, it's Derek Chauvin, I think is how you say it. Right, right now it's Derek Chauvin. I think you go before then, it was probably Harvey Weinstein. Maybe before that, I don't know, Bill Cosby maybe. Right, we, we love to hate them because we can, again, justify our hatred for them. And, and to be clear, right, we should condemn those actions. Right? We, we see evil actions and we call them just that. We call them evil. But I do wonder if, if we love our finger wagging so much and we, we love to, to, to hate them so much because then it takes the focus off of ourselves. Right? The more we're focused on someone else, well, then the better we can ignore our own hatred, the better we can ignore our own prejudice, the better then we can ignore our own manipulation of other people and we can ignore the, the lust in our own heart and our own immoralities. And we might say, well, well they deserve that hatred. And again, we, we condemn those actions. But to bring it back at us, well, what about us, right? What do we deserve? What do we deserve from our God? How should our God respond to us? 
for our love of sin. For our choosing sin over faithfulness to our God who has given so much to us. All right, what should God's response to us be for our own hypocrisy? For our gleefully pointing out the sins in others while ignoring the sin in our own heart? What should God's attitude toward us be for our treating our sins so lightly? For just shrugging them off and saying, well, God will forgive me for it anyway, so I'll just go ahead and do the sin and I'll ask for forgiveness later. Well, for all this, what we deserve is God's hatred, his anger, his wrath. But what we deserve is not what we get. And that is why it is grace. What else could it be but undeserving love when the holy, the innocent, the righteous steps in our place and and stands before him and, and bears the full wrath and anger and hatred of God over our sins? What else could we call it but grace when when wretched sinners as ourselves are invited to take all the ugliness of our sins and, and throw them upon Jesus as he bears their full weight and guilt on the cross and so that we instead can, can be clothed in this beautiful robe of his own righteousness and holiness. Grace is what we have received and it is by grace that we are saved. And so it is grace that the Apostle Paul points these Christians in Corinth to. Yes, they they had their problems, they had their sins, as do we. And it is out of grace that those sins are forgiven. And so we are invited and we are implored to leave those sins behind. To not go back to them, but leave those sins at the cross where out of unbelievable grace, they are paid for in full. Next, in this threefold blessing, we are pointed to the love of God. There's an old Prussian parable about a a switch operator for for the train system. And it was this man's job to to turn the train tracks so that the train could pass safely over this, this, this river gorge. And one day, though, some problems occurred. It was one day when, when the, the very last uh, train on the schedule for this man's shift was, was arriving. And so the man did as he was supposed to do. He, he was turning the tracks so the train could cross the gorge. But something went wrong. Right? The, the, the lever that, that locks the tracks in place, it wasn't working. And so the man had to think of something. And on the other side of the river, there was manual controls. And so if he got across the river to the other side, well, there he could manually hold the lock in place. But if he didn't get there, if he didn't do it, well then that train with, with its potentially hundreds of passengers would become derailed and perish in that ravine below. And so the man, he hightails it across this bridge. And he gets over there and, 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 he, and he pulls the lever and, and holds on to it to manually lock that track in place. But then he hears something. He hears his young son calling out to him. And then his blood turns cold as he looks back across that railroad track, that bridge, and he sees his son running across the track after him, calling out to him. And his father realizes his son's not going to make it across this narrow track before that train is upon him. And so he has well, a difficult decision to make. He could, he could let go of that lever and save his son, but, but then that train, with all of its passengers would go right down into that river below. And so the man, he makes his difficult choice and looks away. And as that train made it safely across the river, and as it passed right by where that that switch operator was still holding on to that lever, nobody in that train even even saw the the tear-streaked face of that man. When we hear the love of God. Let's understand what that means. It means that a son was sacrificed so that you might live. It is no wonder that the earth shook and the sun went black when God's own son was crucified. 
Right, when we hear the, the love of God, let, let's, let's comprehend what we're talking about. That a perfect son was sacrificed so that you and I could be made his sons and daughters. That, that a son was sent from his home to come to earth to die so that we could have a home in heaven. You know, we, we talk about people being loving, right? We might describe someone as a, as a loving father or mother, a loving spouse, a loving friend. But when we say that, we understand that that doesn't mean they're always just overflowing with love. Even a loving parent is going to lose, it, lose his or her temper. Right? Even spouses that love each other, they're not going to have a perfect marriage. But what we mean when we say that is, is that Love is a good characteristic or attribute to describe them because overall they seem rather loving. But when we say that God is loving, when we talk about God's love, that's not what we mean. Right? Love isn't merely an attribute, a characteristic of God. No, God is love. Without God, there is no love. There's no love apart from him. God is love's true source. All love flows from him and he shows nothing but perfect love all the time. God is so loving, in fact, that he doesn't even know how to give a bad gift. The book of James tells us that every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of the heavenly lights. And God the Father's love for you is as strong and great today as it was on that day when he sent his Son to the cross for you. And finally, the final blessing from our triune God that we are appointed to is the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. You know, we talked about Christian fellowship at the beginning. And again, that, that fellowship, that unity that we have with one another, it flows from that fellowship, that unity that we have with our triune God. And the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, it is created by and it is sustained by and it is guided and directed by the Holy Spirit. And that unity, that fellowship that we have with God it was created and it begun in our heart when the Holy Spirit ignited that flame of faith in our heart. Right? It is through that faith that, that all the gracious work of Christ on that cross, all the, the blessings, the benefit, the forgiveness, it's through that faith that those things become personally our own. And the Holy Spirit, he sustains us in that unity, that fellowship with God. He didn't just ignite that flame in our heart and then take off. No, he, he remains, he's still there. And he's fanning that flame and, and he's feeding that faith through the word and the sacrament. And the Holy Spirit, he guides us and he directs us and he empowers us to live lives that demonstrate we have fellowship and unity with God. The Holy Spirit empowers us to put to death our sinful nature. And he guides us to, to live according to the new nature. He guides us to live lives that are pleasing to God in accordance with his will. The Holy Spirit inspires within us love for others by, by showing us again and again that love of God the Father, the grace of Christ his Son. And the Holy Spirit, he, he guides and he directs us to, to give ourselves fully to the one who gave himself for us. He leads us to give ourselves and commit ourselves fully to the mission which Jesus has given us to go and make more disciples, to share that love of the Father and the Son with others. This lesson, it, it, it points us to all of those blessings, all the blessings from our triune God, the love, the grace, and the fellowship. And then it says about all these blessings, it says, may all those blessings be with you all. And Martin Luther once said that, that the heart of religion is found in the pronouns. Right? It's an understanding that what our almighty triune God has done he has done for you. The grace of Jesus Christ, it's yours personally. The Father loves you with that everlasting love. The Holy Spirit has called you into that beautiful fellowship. You know, this topic of, of the, our triune three God, or our, tri, our triune three in one God, three distinct persons, yet one God. You know, it's not just a topic for, for theological textbooks. Right? It's not a conversation to be relegated to, to seminary classrooms. You know, this is the truth and the revelation of who our God is 
and what he has done and what he has, and he continues to do to save us and to bless us. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. And we'll continue by confessing our faith together. And today we'll use uh, selected portions of the Athanasian Creed. Uh, this is a creed that, uh, I believe we only use this on Holy Trinity Sunday, but it's a, a creed that, that expresses uh, the, the, the triune nature of our God. Uh, it's a much longer creed than this, but we have selected portions that we're going to be using today. We confess together. Now this is the true Christian faith. We worship one God in three persons and three persons in one God without mixing the person or dividing the being. For each person, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is distinct. But the deity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one, equal in glory and co-eternal in majesty. What the Father is, so is the Son, and so is the Holy Spirit. The Father is uncreated, the Son uncreated, the Holy Spirit uncreated. The Father is infinite, the Son infinite, the Holy Spirit infinite. The Father is eternal, the Son eternal, the Holy Spirit eternal. Yet they are not three who are eternal, but there is one who is eternal. Just as they are not three who are uncreated, nor three who are infinite, but there is one who is uncreated and one who is infinite. In the same way, the Father is almighty, the Son is almighty, the Holy Spirit is almighty. Yet they are not three who are almighty, but there is one who is almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. Yet they are not three gods, but one God. And within this trinity, none comes before or after, none is greater or inferior, but all three persons are co-equal and co-eternal, so that in every way, all three persons are to be worshipped as one God, and one God worshipped as three persons. And we'll continue with prayer. Today we want to include in our prayer a prayer for Bernice Wolf. Uh, late last night, early this morning, uh, Friday morning, I'm sorry, Saturday morning, Friday night, uh, Bernice Wolf was taken to the emergency room. Um, uh, she, they're still doing tests to figure out exactly what, what the problem is. Um, so we'll provide updates uh, through email when, when we do find out more. But I but, uh, want to keep her in her prayers as she is in the hospital. And of course, with uh, COVID-19, uh, being as it is right now, right, she's not allowed to have visitors. So we especially want to keep her in her prayers as, you know, in that time of loneliness in the hospital. We pray. God, our Father, whatever is good in us, whatever good things we have and whatever good we do comes from you alone. Open our eyes to see the gifts you shower down on us daily, purely out of your own fatherly love and care. Lord Jesus, our Savior, you came into our world to make the Father known to us. You joined yourself to us by taking on our humanity. You brought us back to God by shedding your blood in love you walked the way of suffering and bore alone the wrath of God, the wrath that we by our sins deserved. Help us believe that all you did, all that you suffered and all that you endured, you did for us to rescue us and to set us free. Creator Spirit, you have opened our eyes by the bright light of your word and you have burst through our deafness with the clear sound of your voice in the scriptures. You have breathed into us a new life by the power of the gospel. Through word and sacrament, help us grow in understanding and make us firm in our resolve to do battle with our sin. In every weakness be our strength, that we may show ourselves to be God's children 
faithful in prayer, constant in hope, and fervent in love. Compassionate Father, in your mercy you transform even sickness and pain and disease into a blessing for your children. And with this confidence, we commit all who are sick or suffering to your tender care. And today we pray especially for Bernice Wolf. We ask that you provide healing and relief according to your infinite wisdom and your boundless mercy. We ask that you be with her uh, in her loneliness and solitude in the hospital. Give her that reminder that, that you are present with her, that your love surrounds her, and that you are still working all things out for her good. Help her to find that, that true spiritual strength through Jesus and his cross during this time of, of weakness. By the work of the Holy Spirit, teach her to trust in your forgiveness, grace, and love. And we ask that you hear us, Lord, as we now bring you our private petitions. O Holy Trinity, you are the God of glory, the God of grace, the God of every comfort. From you and through you and to you are all things. We rejoice to call you Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and so to praise your holy name forever. And we join together in the prayer which Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We'll continue with the closing prayer and blessing. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen.